I'm an artist, researcher, and writer. My writing, you might characterize as a kind of media forensics. I'm always looking at the ways in which materials are actually not just representative, but they have agency in indexing the event itself. We have to understand politics at the level of microprocessing. A fundamental kind of component of my practice is understanding how the machines actually can do their work. There was this interesting machine, and it was called a Muirhead picture transmitter, that had been used to transmit the very famous image of Kim Fook from Saigon to New York, where it appeared in the New York Times. I didn't have any idea that that very iconic image arrived in the United States as an audio file. The way it actually appeared in the New York Times. It's a very, very different looking image. Highly degraded, full of noise, full of lots of visual defects. And it's slightly contaminated by the other image prints that would have been on the plate. The production of that image then is not the singular act. No, this image is a highly aggregated set of data. We can't read all of this other information and produce any sort of narrative coherence. But that image itself carries a kind of history. The image we see now is a much more refined version of that because it's subsequently been reprinted as a fine art print from the 35 millimeter neg. An image isn't just a kind of singular representation of an event. It's always embedded in a much bigger network of technical, political, social relations. My job as a writer then is to unpack that, to also reinvent that image to produce greater insights into the ways in which it was produced. It's quite extraordinary to think of all of the complicated set of conditions that had to be met for that image to make its way onto the covers of the newspapers. My work is always about taking something that has been kind of flattened of affect and reduced and trying to thicken or open that up again. The iconic image of that little girl was hugely important for the anti-war movement, but the subject never retains her subjectivity as a complex figure in that conflict. Its histories, its emotional capacities, it's political underpinning. It's all of that has been compressed. My project is trying to open that up again, to actually re-articulate something that's been radically reduced and compressed. Films, photographs, videos have always been important to the research I do. In the case of Kosovo, I looked at a video that was shot in the aftermath of these massacres. At certain moments, the image really kind of falls apart. It's highly degraded. So there's other information about the making of that tape that is also disclosed by its material defects. The material could not organize itself into this clear and coherent image that constitutes the very kind of incommensurability of that kind of event. All of these things to me are like traces of the event itself. It 
Two days after the explosion at Chernobyl, Vladimir Shevchenko was granted permission to fly into the zone and document it. He noticed that a portion of the film was very heavily pockmarked. It was defective. На экране один из кадров, который студийный АТК сначала задержал как брак. Но это не брак. Это зримый лик радиации. Вглядитесь. What he had actually captured on film was, in fact, the event itself. It's both evidence of the event, but also the event of evidence. The film itself, due to its highly compromised material condition, has become the most dangerous and toxic piece of cinema that exists. I was doing some research around Operation Crossroads, which was the nuclear testing that they were doing in the Marshall Islands. They were trying to measure the degree of exposure and contamination. Everything is in readiness for the test-able experiment, and military and scientific personnel leave the target area. On able day minus one, command ships proceed to an area approximately 14 miles from the lagoon where the blast can be safely observed. More than half the world's photographic technology was used to record a single event. Many types of special motion picture and still cameras were encased in huge lead vaults. These unusual enclosures, built of reinforced concrete to withstand the primary blast action, were lined with thick sheets of lead to protect film from the effects of radioactivity, which would otherwise fog the sensitive material. It's a kind of defining moment where you understand the degree to which the information from images is going to play a role in the production of scientific truth. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. With the explosion of the first atmospheric nuclear test, the world's baseline radiation level changed forever. There's no going back. Arguably, the radical light of the atomic bomb has to be understood also as some sort of quasi-photographic practice. Atomic shadows come out of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The intense heat of the nuclear blast actually seared all manner of things directly into the material infrastructure of the city. There's a kind of silhouette of themselves as a living subject that's permanently sealed into the concrete and asphalt. There's a rubble that carries these traces of these bodies. It's become a kind of historical artifact. There is another example of an extremely radical contact print. Aesthetic practices have been very effective in exposing injustice. But exposure doesn't translate into necessarily changing the conditions of people's lives. The value of my work is the ways in which it can bring a certain set of people together, a certain set of kind of ideas, disciplines, epistemologies that wouldn't naturally kind of speak to each other. The evidential record is enormous. My worry is to what degree can legal institutions that will ultimately have to adjudicate war crimes, what's the degree to which they have become technically savvy and change with the times?